Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 22 years ago, I walked into uh, the basement uh, of a campaign office and uh, I met Arnold Chan. I hate that I can say his name. I don't want to be able to do that in this place. Arnold um, instantly became one of my best friends. And anybody who knows him knows that his care and passion for all that he does and everyone that is around him is evident. Uh, I met him at a time that was particularly challenging uh, in my life just because I was so scared. I was young, I was 20 years old. Uh, I had just found out that I was going to have a son. Um, that son happens to be here today and actually worked for Arnold. And Arnold was that steady, calm voice in my life that every dark moment in my life he evened me out and uh, he made things okay. Uh, he was somebody I could pick up the phone and call and talk to, somebody who gave me advice, who was a mentor, uh, somebody I looked up to. And in the years that we knew each other, we dreamed about this place and coming here. And when we were both elected at the same time, unfortunately, um, he had already had the cloud of, of, of illness but we did get that opportunity to serve together. But when we talked, of course, we dreamt of all these things that we wanted to do together and, and we were supposed to walk out those doors together having done them. And although we didn't, we're not going to get that chance, uh, I did get a chance to talk to Arnold in those last days and with his remarkable wife, Jean, and his phenomenal kids, Nathaniel, uh, Ethan and Theo, who were his life, uh, that he talked about every moment I saw him, every day I saw him. Uh, that for him, when he came here, uh, it was a way to make the world a better place for them. And at first, when he knew he was going to go, he wanted to give the speech that I'm about to, to read himself, uh, but it became apparent that he wasn't going to be able to do it. and I. I wish that it was him. I can picture him sitting over my left shoulder right now and I hate to look back and know he's not there. I just want to let you know how much he loved you, how much everything he did was to try to make a world a better place for you, and that in his final moments when he was talking about the issues that he cared about and worried about, yes, he cared about this house, but he mostly cared about this house for what a better world it could make and what a better world it could make for you. These are Arnold's um, last words to this House. Mr. Speaker, from the beginning of my parliamentary career, I have been preoccupied with the issues surrounding the exercise of democracy. This has been a passion of mine since my youth, and it is the touchstone for all of my work as a member of Parliament Canada. It is fitting that I address these issues once more today to my colleagues. My inaugural speech in Parliament focused on the themes of democracy, since I rose in the House that day to discuss the private member's bill introduced by the member for Wellington Halton Hills to reform the Canada Elections Act and the Parliament of Canada Act, I had the opportunity in that speech to address what I felt were important elements of change that were needed in Parliament, which would hopefully help to reverse a trend of dysfunction that had been growing for far too long. On June the 11th of this year, I had the opportunity again to direct my comments to issues of democracy and the conduct of our business in Parliament. I wish that my children could have been present, but of course June is a time for examinations in school. Nonetheless, I had them and their generation very much in mind that day, and I do again now as I consider the critical challenges of the future and the role of democracy and democratic institutions in meeting those challenges. I believe that we as a society and a government are just beginning to grapple with three existential threats that will face my children's generation. Climate change, accelerating technological change, and the social unrest that arises in reaction to these first two forces. Climate change is undeniably the focus of attention today, as it should be. The recent flooding in Texas, hurricane in Caribbean and Florida, violent monsoon rains in Bangladesh and northern India, and closer to home, the BC wildfires, all point to an increasingly unpredictable and potentially destructive pattern of change 
to which everyone must adapt. This is, in part, why I continue to appreciate the presence and advocacy of the Leader of the Green Party, the member for Saanich Gulf Islands, along with the leadership of the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Their tireless work is to be commended and supported. Climate change is not just about storms, flooding and heat. It is also about crop failure, food shortage, water scarcity, mass displacement of people and violent conflicts that can arise out of these situations. It is imperative that we stop treating climate change as solely an environmental issue, but recognize it as an all-encompassing priority that we must, as a society and as a government, confront with utmost urgency. One important response to climate change is the focus on technological solutions, but technology itself represents a second challenge. In particular, the confluence of artificial intelligence, robotics, and genomics represents the potential for profound change to the relationship between people, machines, and their environment. There has been much discussion recently of the impact on human employment of self-driving cars and the increased use of robots from everything from manufacturing to personal services. This has led to speculation about the future of work itself and the possible dislocation of social relationships that have existed since the foundation of cities 10,000 years ago. These are issues that are we just beginning to grapple with but with which we will be profoundly important to the, uh, to, for my children and for their generation. In the face of relentless technological change and economic competition, how resilient will our social institutions be? How will our communities manage the potential for mass unemployment or even just fear those kinds of changes? Therein lies the third challenge, reactionism. In the face of climate change, accelerating technological advancements and the disruptions they are causing, the tendency of people and communities to circle the wagons, and even worse, to fear the other. We have already seen evidence of this around the world. Increasing nationalism, religious fundamentalism, and isolationism, rising secular violence in many countries, distrust of elites, and strife based on economic class. So what do we do? We are members of Parliament, a body which is ultimately about civilized discussion and debate. The word Parliament itself derives from the French word parler, to speak. Our task is to exercise democracy through communication, deliberation, and ultimately decision-making. Not in our interest, but in the interests of the people. We are representatives of, and we are responsible to the people of our country. And it is our responsibility and our duty to try to meet the challenge of the day through our best collective effort. In facing the challenges of climate change, accelerating technological change, and the forces of reactionism, we must remember that our greatest strengths lie within our civility to each other, our humanity in the face of our own limitations, and our own willingness to serve. We can adapt to change. We can respond to challenges, but we adapt and respond best when we do so after reasoned debate with an open mind and through listening careful, carefully to the needs of those we are so fortunate to serve. But there is one more step in thinking about and managing the problems of the future, and that is to consider who the we of Parliament should be. Historically, our greatest our great parliament has been predominantly comprised of men and largely of European descent. It was only in 2014, just three short years ago, that there was a Chinese liberal MP named Arnold Chan in the GTA, an Asian male. On the issue of gender balance, despite it being nearly 100 years since the first woman was elected to parliament, we are still far from balanced. Our government has taken some good steps to address this, but we can and should do more. We owe it to ourselves, our community, and our children to strive for improvement in our democratic institutions so that we can better serve our communities and better meet those challenges of the future. Diversity is healthy and increases the chances of survival and success, a truth known at least since Charles Darwin. The greater the range of ideas and opinions that are brought to bear the problem of the day, the more likely we are as an institution to be able to come up with workable solutions that serve our communities. 
A greater diversity of members will in turn bring those broader ideas forward. Mr. Speaker, my call to action to my colleagues is to constantly to be open to new ideas, to be willing to adjust the assumptions that ground one's viewpoint, if the facts of the world and the challenge of the day requires it. I would also upon, call upon greater empowerment of diverse voices as a foundation of addressing the challenges that face us. But my call is not only to my colleagues in Parliament, it is also to other Canadians of visible minority descent. We should not be satisfied with the status quo. <laughs> we should not expect more, we should expect more rather for ourselves and our children. But at the same time, it is up to us to be braver to go beyond our comfort zone and to engage with people of other backgrounds, to diversify and broader our relationships, and to seek the betterment of all. We have to take a chance to engage and to participate. That will help strengthen the institutions that serve us. The triple challenges of climate change, accelerating technological change, and social reactionism are extraordinary and radical, and our ultimate response has to be as well. However, if we maintain our commitment to our democratic institutions and broaden and diversify our institutions to reflect the range of voices present in our society, I am confident that we can take the steps necessary to meet these challenges, to flourish one step at a time. Well, I wish I could be there for you and with you to contribute more to the great work of our Parliament and to the better world for my children and yours. I will have to leave this to you, my colleagues. I wish you well. Arnold Champ, I love you. <laughs>